라슬로 박사님 거기는 이른 시간인데 이렇게 대담에 임해 주셔서 대단히 고맙고 또 한편으로는 죄송합니다. It's not an o c 박사님의 박사님의 기조 강연은 정말 인상적이었습니다. 제가 들었던 여러 강연 중에서 가장 비판적인 목소리를 많이 담으셨고 그 다음에 아주 시적절한 내용이었다고 생각이 됩니다. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
박사님은 어, 아까 강연에서 말했던 것처럼 지구상의 위기가 결국은 인류 문명 전체의 붕괴나 위기로 갈 것이다 그런데 그 위기의 근본적인 원인이 임계점으로 치닫고 있는 재앙적인 양분하다 라고 말씀하셨는데 저를 포함해서 여러 사람이 과연 그 재앙적인 양분화가 어떤 것인지 조금 더 구체적이고 생생한 예시를 들어주시기 바랍니다. Well, what we know from the model of modeling of complex systems is when these systems reach the threshold of stability, then they become unstable. They become extremely sensitive to change. <웃음> then their so-called butterfly effects can surface. That means that even a butterfly moving its wings can create a storm when it is amplified and amplified. The system is open to change. The worst thing that could happen, I think, in a situation of, of danger, of crisis, is not to change, is not to believe in the necessity and the possibility of change. That's the worst thing that could happen. Because when you have a, a bifurcation, <clears throat> when you reach the point of a catastrophic bifurcation, which affects the entire system, then that system either collapses down to its stable components, which could be below the level of the individual human being even, you don't know what will be ultimately be stable, what would survive a true catas global catastrophe, or <clears throat> it can move together, move to create a higher level system from the components that are made up the unstable system. And this possibility is now in front of us. Because this joining together is not an artificial, arbitrary human trait, it is embedded in the nature of evolution. All evolution is moving toward integration, <coughs> toward wholeness, toward creation. Otherwise, we would still be having a, a universe that is made of inert gases flowing, floating and, and dispersing. That we have a coherent universe. And the coherence, as Einstein said, is the most remarkable fact about nature, about the universe, how coherent it is that we have such a coherent universe is because all its elements seek to join together, seek, if, if they are not subverted, seek to create the higher level system. So for level A in bifurcation, we can move to level B, and level B, if it's threatened again, if it's in under bifurcation, we can move to level C and so on. This is evolution, non-linear evolution, yeah. evolution across bifurcation. It's not a smooth process, it's a process interspersed with, with instabilities, with the disruptions of the current system. And what we are having today is a disruption, is an extremely global level, strong disruption. It has been initiated, catalyzed by the virus, the COVID-19 virus. And in that sense, we can be grateful that this disruption has occurred because it accelerates the possibilities, the willingness to change on, on, on all levels, on the level of people, on the level of leadership. It calls attention to the unsustainability of our system. It calls attention to the global outreach of all, everything that occurs in the system. As I said in my speech, speech, our crisis is global level. It embraces all aspects of life and all populations. And that that system is becoming unstable, as it evidently is now, through climate change, through the virus, also through violence, and through intolerance, through exhaustion, exhausting of the resources that we need, through, through the un, unprecedented and unmindful, unminded competition that goes single-minded competition that is for, for wealth and for power. All of these factors are rendering the system unstable. And all of these factors need to be taken into account as we join together to create 
where these factors are not at odds with each other, but they join together. Just as the human body joins together, all cells, all organs of the human body, they are not the same, they are very diverse, but they don't work at opposite ends. If a part of that human system, the body, is not collaborating with the rest, then it's a disease in the body. And it can also endanger the body. As a typical case is cancer, a group of cells that is only growing without regard of the, of, uh, regarding the effect on other parts of the system. So we need to join together, and I believe it is embedded in us, embedded in our heart and in our brain, embedded in every cell of the body, that we are seeking oneness, we are seeking to join, we are seeking to create a higher level system, which will be a global system, which will be envisaged already by the founder of Chunki University and by Dr. Inbon Chu, the current chancellor, that this system can be a global level system which will bring unity to all its levels. Because we have to have unity, integration on all levels. And we need that, that shake-up, that bifurcation that we are talking about, to bring that about in time before the system could move to the unsustainability level of irreversibility. Before that, we need to have to be shaken up. We need to be shaken up. And this is happening now, today. In that sense, the virus crisis is a blessing in disguise. Hopefully, it doesn't, it doesn't require too many human sacrifices, health sacrifices. But all crises can be taken as a blessing in disguise. Because we must act, we must wake up, and we help, help us to wake up so that we could act. Paksajim 코비드 위기나 기후 위기 상황에서 이걸 역사적 기회로 삼겠다는 부분은 현실 그대로 받아들이는 게 아니라 거기서 어떤 극심한 위기 상황에서 기회를 돌리는데 돌리는데 실질적으로 변화는 이건 우리 현실 아니겠습니까? 21세기에. 근데 어떻게 변화할 것인지, how to change 이 부분을 강조하셨는데 저는 기본적으로 세계 정치인들이나 세계 기업인들 그런 사람들의 어떤 현실 인식이 바뀌어야 한다고 생각이 됩니다. 거기에 대해서 박사님은 어떤 얘기를 해 주실 수 있겠습니까? We had an old myth, an old belief that is very counterfunctional. That whatever is good for a company is good for the whole country. What is good for one country is good for the whole world. This was a kind of a, a belief that things will work out, perhaps through the invisible hand of Adam Smith, the, the economist, that the market will all settle all things. But the belief that what is good for a part is good for the whole has been a basic belief. And it turns out that it doesn't work. Because what is good for a part mm -hmm. may be in the very degenerative, very dangerous for the whole. We have to take in mind, keep in account of what is good for the whole system has to be at the forefront of our thinkers, of our thinking. What is good for America is good indeed for a company. There was a famous saying by the former president of General Motors that what is good for General Motors is good for the United States. He claimed that, and I think it was accepted at the time, several decades ago, that this is true. And big business operates on that. What is good for my company is about to somehow be good for humanity. And then we see what is happening. We see how the earth is being overexploited, how we see the gap between the rich and the poor is growing, 
how the, the good for the part or the company very often produces a short-term advantage and a long-term basic flaw in the system. So we have to reshift our attention to the whole system. We have to understand that. How to understand it? You can turn to science, for example. Science will always tell you the new sciences. They are holistic. They tell you what is true for the whole system, what is good for the whole system, is functional for the, for the part. The human body is an integral system, an integrated system, integral naturally. And that is a system that maintains itself. If it's healthy, then all its parts benefit. And if they, in the human individual is truly healthy, it also is a positive factor in its environment. The human individual that is exploited of its environment and trying to dominate others, that is an aberration, that is a fault in the system. We need to return to the idea that the overall system of life on Earth is the priority. Is that what we must maintain? Then we can cope with global crises such as climate change and flooding and all the relevant, all the, com all the collaterative problems because we, we are looking at the overall system, what causes that flooding, what causes that dryness, that desiccation, what causes the violence, what motivates unsustainability, inequality, conflict, unbridled competition. These are all elements that were present in the current system. They all have to be overcome. They are no longer the time to exercise that kind of individualism where only the one individual or the one company, the one nation is in the forefront. We must create a collaborative world a world where all people, that all people share and that together they maintain in a form of sustain, sustainability that allows all elements of the system to live, to survive, indeed to thrive. 기업인과 정치인들이 당연히 각성을 하고 뭔가 협력적인 작업도 해야 되는 것이지만 근본적으로는 시민 사회가 바뀌어야 돼야 할것 같습니다. 혹시 박사님 기억하십니까? 제가 읽었던 책 중에서 어, Individualism, Collectivism and Political Power 그 초기 조작에서 박사님이 헝가리 혁명을 경험하신 다음에 어, 영어로 말씀드리겠습니다. Spontaneous Collectivism 자발적인 집단주의라는 말씀을 하시더라고요. 실질적으로 아무리 위기 상황일지라도 지구상에 인류 문명은 지속이 돼야 되는 거고 생존해야 되지 않겠습니까? 그때 그 실천의 문제를 저는 이제 계속 박사님 책을 보면서 고민했는데 거기서 이제 박사님이 제시하는 부분이 이 문화, 문화를 강화시키라 인파워링 쿼처 그 부분을 강조하셨습니다 그러시면서 우리 자신을 탐구해야 되고 그 다음에 예술적인 종교적인 처음을 해야 되고 더 나아가서는 양자 물리학이나 과학의 방법을 동원해야 한다고 생각했습니다. 제가 지금 여기서 묻고 싶었던 부분은 소크라테스의 경구 너 자신을 알라를 더 확장해서 너 자신을 상호 연결된 가운데 급속하게 변화하고 있는 세계의 한 부분으로 알라 상호 연결성을 강조하셨는데 그 상호 연결성에 대한 얘기가 뭐 벌써 나왔습니다만 다시 한번 강조하신다면요 well, We have to get, as you rightly say We have to get the leaders to create a new paradigm to work on the basis of a new paradigm, not separateness, not just exaggerated individuality, not exaggerated collectivism either, but to find a systemic approach where all people, all systems are both part and whole. They are like the ancient uh, legend of Janus, 
the genus phased entity that has two phases, forward and backward. And one phase is always the part. We are parts, yes. We are parts, but we are also parts of a larger system. And we have to fit ourselves into that larger system. But we are at the same time holes of which of the parts that make us up. We are both. And we must maintain ourselves as a, as a two-phase genus phase system. And that is something that world leaders and people both need to understand. Mm -hmm. On the level of the world leaders, business leaders, political leaders, we are treating ourselves or individuals also as whole systems. And we try to show and make these systems operate as a whole system. We are also parts, we are also systems within that system. And we have to be aligned with the overall system. We need to have coherence, unity, integration on all levels. On the, on the levels where the quantum join together to make atoms, on the level where stellar systems join together in galaxies, and galaxies join together in the meta galaxies. So they are various levels. This is a multi-level system. It's a fractal system. It repeats, the dynamic repeats on all its levels. We have to get the top level, yes. We have to also get the bottom level. The bottom level, let me just add that, the bottom level is the spontaneous worldview, not necessarily conscious, but spontaneous and yet effective worldview of people on the, in the everyday level of society. People who work, people who live without studying, without asking themselves too many questions formally, but they have a worldview. And that view is, reflects their personality, their consciousness. And that consciousness also has to be informed, has to move toward a level where we, even people on the everyday level understand that their community does not end. They are part of nature, they are part of larger communities. Let me just say, traditional people understood this. This is there. This is there, knowing that, as the American Indians have said, and Asians have said all along, we do not live above and, and mastering the, the world around us. We live in nature. We are part of nature. We are part of the harmony of evolution in nature. Traditional people understood this. We need to recover this knowledge that we are part of a larger whole and that larger whole evolves. So understood this intellectually on the level of leaders, understood it spontaneously on the level of everyday people. Mm -hmm. That is the task before us, the mission, how to get this across. We need education, not in the old sense of educating people, but in the new sense of organizations, institutions of learning, where we can learn together, where we can dip into the deeper wisdom that comes through spirituality, that also comes through science, where religion, science, and spirituality join together to show that we are all systems living together and we have converted, subverted this system and it's time to come back, come back where we can again live together as a functioning part of the larger whole and the largest whole that is relevant to our life is the biosphere itself, the system of life. We need every part of the system, every species in the system, every element that is chemical, or informational, or, or physical, or whatever. You need all these elements together to create a functional system that is truly sustainable. We have subverted this, created an unsustainable, un, un, unmaintainable system, and now is the time to recognize that. The system of life, the whole biosphere, that is our womb, that is our mother, that is the whole of which we are a part. Mm -hmm. And leaders have to understand it intellectually. People have to understand it spontaneously. There has to be a change in consciousness. This change is coming apart, I think, among young people. It's already emerging. The songs that you have heard here a moment ago and the poems all testify that there is an awakening. Young people are coming together. 
to understand peace is optimal, peace is, is the supreme goal, oneness, love, and all the elements that we need to live on this planet. This is happening. We need to accelerate it. We need to catalyze it. And we need to help leaders to deal with it, to help us, to help young people come together, express their innate, inherent oneness, seeking wish. And if they can do that, then there is hope that there will be change. Not change that is directed from above, it's change that comes from below. That is the change that we need. And organizations like such as Chunky University are a key element in bringing about this kind of a change. 긍정적인 변화 참 중요한 얘기입니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 이 시대는 또 어떤 위기, 어떤 사건을 우리가 경험할지 모릅니다. 그렇게 되다 보면은 어떤 정부나 어떤 사회에서 야만적인 강제력이 개입할 상황도 생기리라고 생각이 됩니다. 그에 대한 박사님의 의견은 어떠신지요? Uh, it has been said some time ago that the only thing we should not be surprised at is to be surprised. Because many things are happening that were unforeseen. But it can be, if you have a broader worldview, an extended sense of who we are, how we belong to the world, how that world encompasses us, if we have that, then I think there will be no more really surprises. We won't know what's happening in detail. We can't foretell. The system is so complex. We can't foretell in, in detail what is going to happen next. But we will know that a system that is perturbed, that is, that is uh, disrupted as it is today, as becoming disrupted, the sudden change effect can happen. These are surprising. Butterfly effects are surprising. Let's take this legend of the butterfly that flaps its wings. Let's say in California and in Korea, there is a, there's a, a thunderstorm as a result of amplification and amplification of this, of this, of this air current of air that is created by the butterfly. That might be, if you look at the thunderstorm in Korea, you might be surprised how it has come about because you don't recognize the butterfly that has created it. Yet, we have to look down more and more what caused it. The ultimate cause, we will not know in detail, but we will know that it's a disruption in the system. And what we need to do is to create understanding, comprehension, comprehension and the, the key word that I always like to emphasize, coherence. The system has to be coherent, has to be finely tuned so that it can function together that every part responds to every other part. And together, they build the system. Togetherness in this higher sense is the key to peace and to well-being, and even to survival. 다음은 박사님의 실천 전략에 대해서 듣고 싶습니다. 박사님은 후기 저작에서 꾸준히 의식의 혁명성을 얘기하고 있습니다. 저도 재앙적인 양분화를 가져오는 제도나 과정, 가치가 거의 80억 인구가 이 자연과 더불어서 평화롭고 조화롭게 살수 있는 제도, 과정, 가치로 바꿔 나가야 할 텐데 박사님은 그 의식이라는 것이 실제 세계의 실제 현상이지만 의식이라는 것이 에너지를 가지고 있고 주파수를 가지고 있고 정보를 가지고 있는 상황에서 항상 여러 가지 위상을 갖게 되는데 그 의식이 물체보다 더 현실적이다. more real. 그 부분이 잘 이해가 안 됩니다. 이에 대한 박사님이 조금 더 구체적으로 얘기해 주십시오. Well, I'm taking this on the basis of a, a speech made by Max Planck, the great German theoretician, physicist, one of the founders of the theory of the atoms theory and the, and the particle uh, 
theories of, of, of the universe. He said, after 40 years of studying the nature of the most fundamental element in the world, which is the atom, he said, and he said literally, I can tell you one thing, in the real world there is no such thing as matter. Of course, we need to explain that. By matter, he meant something that is that is that exists independently of the others. Originally, Democritus thought that matter is uh, uh, indivisible is the ultimate unit. Now it turns out that, met, uh, met, uh, met, uh, our particles are not met, material particles; they are not indivisible. They can be they can be divided. They can be disrupted. They can be broken down to the to the small elements. When you break down material particles, you don't find anything that is matter. We find what is basically. Uh, Spurs and patterns of energy. Energy gov being governed by something that we can best call information. The ultimate reality is what I like to call informed energy. Energy which is the effective agent but which, which acts in the world. It's already integrated in and expressed by quanta and then by atoms and molecules and crystals and cells and organizations based on cells and whole ecologies. All of these are forms of, of, of informed energy. When you go down, analyze them, you don't find hard, independent units that we call, call, call matter. That's the Newtonian interpretation of something. The ultimate unit is a little billiard ball, as it were, that interacts and creates the phenomenon of the world. There is no such thing. That is ultimately energy in a very coherent, informed form. This is the new quantum science. David Bohm, the quantum physicist, he mentioned this and, and discussed this. I think if you look at it really, what is happening today in the quantum world, you cannot deal with matter per se. You are dealing with organization, with systems, with wave propagations, with specific forms of, of coding of these waves in certain specific forms of frequency and phase and amplitude. And what we have is basically a, a field of energy and information. I call it in my, some other books, I call it the Akashic field. It's a deeper field. It's a field that underlies the manifest phenomena. It's not a material field. It's not matter that, that, that is uh, partaking in this field. This field is something which is the foundation, is the information is, if you like, in religious terms, in spiritual terms, is the spirit, the divine spirit of the cosmos. That's the religious spiritual manifestation of it. In terms of science, is the unified field, is the grand unified field, or the zero point field, in which all things are embedded, and from which all things originate. So, an entirely new vision of the world, new vision of physical reality, we are not material, separate beings. We are interconnected, interacting, integrated elements of informed energy. 대단히 영감을 주는 말씀이십니다. 저도 박사님이 말씀하신 아카식 필드, 아카식 장에 대해서 깊은 관심을 가지고 있습니다. 특히 동양 철학에서도 많이 얘기하는 부분인데, 저는 이제 박사님께서 의식을 하나의 우주적인 현상으로 얘기했을 때 먼저 떠오르는 생각은 3세기 무렵에 마니즘이라고 들어보셨죠? 거기서 이제 우주론적인 의식을 강조를 하는데 실질적으로 박사님이 말씀하신 부분을 우리가 전적으로 받아들인다 할지라도 문제는 우리가 상황 상황에서 선과 악, 시와 비를 구분해야 되지 않겠습니까? 그런데 만약에 인간의 의식이 우주론 쪽으로 확장이 된다면 어떻게 우리가 선과 악을 구분할 수 있겠고 또 실질적으로 자기가 옳다는 부분을 특수한 상황에서 대처할 수 있겠습니까? Mm. 
No, you have to take into account that this is not a random universe. It's not a universe where anything happens, anything that can happen will happen. It's a selective universe. It's a universe in which the, in, the coherence that we find in nature is already coded in it. It's already there. It was there at the Big Bang when this whole evolutionary process started. The, the, the little elements, the little elements of energy that brought, that, that became concretized as quanta, they are not random, they're random phenomena. They had already the, all the, all the elements, all the laws of nature were operating in them that have appeared later on. So we have to deal with a universe which is oriented in a specific direction. We can derive our concept of good and bad in reference to this direction. In a very simple, but I think profound way, you can say, what is good is what is aligned with evolution. What is good, what helps the elements to come together in integral wholeness. What is bad, what is evil, is what disrupts systems, what creates fragmentation, what creates conflict, degeneration. So in reference to the built-in tropism, which I call the holotropic tropism, a holotropic attractor, just a, 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 a attractor, a tropism toward wholeness, that is the key element. If you are aligned with it, we are a positive factor. We can call it the good, as philosophers have called it over the centuries. If we are in conflict with it, if we are at, attempt to oppose it, even non unconsciously, even without recognizing that we do that, if you not, if we work against it, as for example, this exaggerated individualism and love of the part rather than of the whole, if it does that, that's not good. That's equivalent to evil, not evil in a conscious way in which people are setting out to do harm but acting in a way that they actually do harm. That is anyway a form of event, evil. And for me, to my mind, that's the only form of real form of evil. The rest of the, the, the perceived consciousness form, we can deal with it. We can try to educate, we can try to discuss. But when you're spontaneously working against the whole, that is a real evil. Fortunately, I think it's rare, truly, we are all spontaneously good people. We are good living systems. All living systems seek to be one. And we are part of are living system and we seek that. So fundamentally, I believe that human nature is good. But the human consciousness can subvert it and can be a superficial consciousness, which disrupts this goodness, this, this tendency towards wholeness and creates a downward spiral toward chaos, toward the separation of the whole into the fragmentation, into the part. That, to my mind, is the evil in the world. In a truly enlightened consciousness, a developed and evolved consciousness is working toward wholeness, is working toward integration, toward, toward harmony. As I know, harmony, I think, is a very basic notion in Oriental philosophy, uh, very much act, in put into action in the political, economic, and social sphere as well. It is very basic. It expresses what is good in us. It expresses what is good in the human being. Dr.님 말씀에 많은 부분 공감을 하고 있지만요, 지금도 박사님이 말씀하시고 있는 양자 물리학에 근거하고 있는 우주론적인 의식으로. 시와 비, 선과 악을 구분하는 것은 결코 쉬운 일은 아닌 것 같습니다. 박사님의 말씀을 받아들였을 때 우리가 또 하나 생각해야 할 부분은 언어의 문제입니다. 언어는 우리의 리얼리티, 실제이자 존재의 문제 아닙니까? 그 의식의 문제와 언어에서 박사님이 의식을 그렇게 강조했을 때 우리가 이렇게 지금 소통을 하고 있는 언어가 다분히 도구화 되고 있는 것 같습니다. 그 언어가 도구화 됐을 때 과연 이러한 의식의 문제를 실천으로 연결할 수 있을까요? Well, 
consciousness, we can look at it in a, in a sense of we are superficially what goes on in our mind. That's the traditional old fashioned concept. We can look at it also, and of course, what goes on in our mind is very much a product of the way we respond to our environment, very much a product of our brain and our nervous system. It's the old, old paradigm, the old concept of consciousness. In the newer concept, the consciousness is much deeper. It is what you call cosmic consciousness. It is the consciousness which exists in the world of which the brain is not a producer, but a transformer. The brain is something that transmits that consciousness which exists in the world. And that deeper consciousness is intrinsically and inherently good. It is the transformation of it, the, the transmission of it that can be flawed, that can be mistaken. And the consciousness that exists in the world is the consciousness of a holotropic attractor. It's a, it's a consciousness of holism, of an attraction of one part to another, the attraction toward harmony, toward oneness, which is expressed then, for example, like in the song that we have heard now, half an hour ago, 40 minutes ago, the song of love, putting down our guns and living a life of love. That is an expression through language, and in this case also through music, of that deep holotropism that is there in nature. We have to encourage that. We have to help young people and people of all ages to come back to themselves so they recognize that they deep down, they have this motivation, they have this openness, this tropism to our belonging, to our oneness, and they can feel love unrequited and unconditional love, not for something in exchange of something, but because we feel that we are part. We love ourselves, and so we love our surroundings. So we love humanity, so we love nature. And that is the new quantum concept, where there, are no, there is no separation. All things are interacting, are interpenetrating at all times. tropism 우리 정치 철학의 영어로 하면 common sense, community sense 또는 taste 다시 말해서 common sense의 바탕을 두고 있는 우리의 미적인 판단하고 연관이 있는 것 같습니다. 박사님이 말씀하시는 그 의식혁명 이게 구체적으로 이제 우리가 실천을 해야 할 텐데 그 실천하는 부분이 박사님 초기 저작 거기에 나오더라고요. Essential Society 마지막 장에 보시면은 에시테릭 익스피리언스를 강조하시는 거 기억하십니까? 그 미적 체험, 미적 체험이라는 부분이 우리가 하고 있는 단순한 지각을 개념으로 만들고 하나의 이미지화한다고 보는 것인 거죠. 저도 거기에 전적으로 동의하고요. 이런 부분들이 칸트라든지 한나르트 등을 통해서 일종의 유니버설 테이스트라는 개념으로 나오는 것 같습니다. 판단이 대단히 중요하죠. 박사님 말씀하신 트로피즘 못지않게 중요하다고 생각이 됩니다. 자, 그래서 우리가 이제 이러한 예술적인 체험과 더불어서 박사님이 이제 나이를 들어가시면서 종교적인 체험을 강조하시더라고요. 그래서 예술 체험과 종교적인 체험이 어떤 식으로나 인간과 인간 사이에 깊은 연대를 경험하게 하고 그 다음에 자연과 지구와 우주를 위한 사랑이 가능하다고 했는데 제가 듣고 싶은 것은 박사님을 철학자로 보는 게 아니라 그야말로 타고난 예술가로서 그 다음에 피아노 프로디지로서 그 입장에서 예술적인 체험으로 우리가 이 사회를 어떻게 바꿀 수 있는 것인지 거기에 대한 고견을 들려주십시오. We have not talked about another factor which is significance which is, which is beauty which is ex an ecstatic experience, which is beyond the ordinary. It can be catalyzed by music, by poetry, by dance, by all the plastic, any of the plastic arts. So by drama, by novels, by literature, we can create 
an experience, which you call the aesthetic experience, which is an experience of significance and the experience which you can perceive as, as beauty, as something that is beautiful. And that, I think, is a one way of communicating, sharing, let's say, sharing that, that oneness drive, that drive, that orientation toward oneness and integration, which is inherent in us by producing, by creating, creating works. It doesn't, we can't all produce masterworks in, in music or in, in art of any form. We can appreciate it. We can join in a song. We can appreciate a poem. We can talk to each other in ways that we can extol and highlight the good, the, the love, in each, which is there in each, us, in each of us, in all of us. So we can put it into practice <clears throat> through the aesthetic experience. My origin in coming into this in philosophy, as you well know, since you read my, in my early books, um, mm -hmm. was come from, from music. So because in music you encountered this significant <laughs> experience, which you feel love, you know, then I was trying to see how is that related to, to the world, to the world at last? Is it really a part of the world? And then, of course, you start to inquire, and it's not difficult, not easy to stop. You must continue to inquire. And so I shifted from a profession of music to a profession which is really a mission in philosophy and in global affairs. And it was a natural shift. It just on the, the shifts on the surface. Deep down, it's the same thing. What I had previously sought instinctively, intuitively, and spontaneously, seeking meaning, seeking significance, seeking coherence and beauty, that I tried to continue to seek rationally through science and through philosophy. So in a way, it was a not, 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 not a real bottom, bottom change. It was a surface change. 사실은 제 아들도 음악을 합니다. 그래서 음악과 철학을 같이 했으면 하는데 음악하면서 워낙 시간이 아까워서 철학하는 쪽을 포기를 하더라고요. 책을 읽는 것보다 음악에 더 빠져드는 것을 좋아하더라고요. 그래서 조금 저는 최근에 박사님의 그 자서전 Simply Genius and Other Stay from My Life라는 책을 좀 읽었습니다. 거기에 대단한 힘을 가진 어떤 그 피아니스트, 어떤 벌초워서 어떤 장인의 모습을 보기도 하고 그러면서 또 남은 시간에 작곡을 하시는 게 아니라 철학에 대한 메모를 남기셨지 않습니까? 그런 과정을 보시면서 만약에 박사님이 어머니의 인도를 받지 않고서 처음부터 철학을 했더라면 어떤 분으로 거듭났을까? 뭐 제가 볼때 박사님은 대표적인 르네상스 맨입니다. 그야말로 다재다능하신 분인데 그 다재다능하신 부분들이 실질적으로 이 과학 철학이나 어떤 철학 쪽으로 선회한 것은 거기에 박사님 속에 철학적인 피가 더 많았던 것일까요? 아니면 더 종합적인 어떤 성취를 위한 것이었을까요? <웃음> I was not seeking philosophy as a profession, just the same way as I was not seeking music as a profession either. I was not concerned with the external aspects of it. I was not concerned just to, to, to publish more or to get my ideas across or to be sharp when I'm criticizing others. I'm not concerned with the typical academic parts of, of philosophy in a, in a as a negative sense of philosophy. Philosophy is the search for, for wisdom, for truth, philosophia, a love of wisdom. And it's the same search that I had when I was playing the piano. Mm -hmm. it's, it was instinctive. It was, it was, to me, I was, I was trained as a concert pianist. But then what, what, what my mother said to me, for example, now play it with feeling. We used to say that because first you play it to, to study, to memorize the score, you know. 
and then you get your fingers to obey you to do that, to do to play it right. But then you sit down and forget all that, forget the, the technique, the mechanism, mm -hmm. and just get the feeling of it. So my mother used to say, now sit down and play it with feeling. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, of course, then I had entered into another level of, of experience and you know, another dimension of existence, more dynamic, more whole, and very, very deeply attractive, very deeply based on the love of, of, of for everything. So basically I have, you know, I have continued mm -hmm. To, to search, to seek, in a way you can call it egoistic, because I was searching to understand my own understanding. But then when I reach any level of understanding, however modest it may be, mm -hmm. that I feel it says some element of truth and value, then I was intent on sharing it. Mm -hmm. Sharing it in music by playing concerts, you sharing it in philosophy by giving lectures and by writing it down in, in philosophical treatises. And now increasingly by organizing and bringing people together to, to pose the right questions like you are posing and try to do about implementing their life, in their life, the answers to these questions. It's <laughs> 박사님은 아주 아기 때부터 신동으로서 정말로 잘 노셨던 것 같습니다. 피아노를 치시면서도 자기 친구들과 노는 것 같은 느낌을 가졌었고, 그 다음에 베토벤의 아주 대단한 피아노 곡을 소나타를 연주하시면서도 이걸 단순히 그 악보를 따라간 게 아니라 자신의 전체의 존재를 통해서 그 음악을 흡수하는 그런 모습을 보여주신 것 같아요. 정말로 박사님은 음악을 할 때는 박사님 자신이 음악 속으로 들어가 살고 있는 그런 모습이 저는 대단히 중요하다고 봤는데요. 그래서 일단은 그 플레잉, 플레잉 뮤직, 플레잉 뭐 일단 여러 가지 대화, 대, 다른 사람들과 공유하는 거 그런 부분도 이제 염두에 두시면서 저는 이제 박사님께서 올해 여든 아홉이시지 않습니까? 어떤 식으로 뭐 방금 그 만나고 온 친구가 그 얘기 하더라고요. 아무리 천재도 나이 먹으면 다 똑같아. 그런 말씀을 하시더라고요. 박사님께 음악가로서 과학 철학자로서 또 여러 휴머니스트로서 나이를 먹어 간다는 게 어떤 의미였습니까? Uh, hopefully, it means recognizing that's what you really want, what you, what you are seeking. In my new autobiography, which will be published in October, which is called uh, My Journey, I say that this is a life mm -hmm. devoted to seeking the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. So, to me, I recognize that what I wanted all along was to find meaning in, well, in my existence, and that means the existence of human beings, and that also means the existence of life on Earth and wherever in the universe. So it's what being getting older means, getting more down to the essentials. Now, this is superficial elements of life. I'm less interested in that. I want to understand who I am, what the world is, and how I can be a positive factor in this world becoming a better world. 이제 저희들이 시간을 조금 거의 이제 한 시간을 다 써버려서 조금 더 질문 드릴 게 많은데 이제 거의 이제 저희들이 정리를 해야 되겠는데요. 일단 박사님께서 이 위기 상황에 미래 세대, future generation, 이게 어떤 메시지 또 어떤 실천을 말씀해 주시고 싶고 특히 박사님은 뭐 GIP를 포함해서 경희대와 대단한 인연을 가지고 계십니다. 경희 공동체에서 또 미래의 리더들이 자라나고 있습니다. 
제가 근무하고 있는 호마니테스 칼리지도 한국에서 최초의 교양 전담 대학으로 출범해서 벌써 11년째 돼가고 있습니다. 이런 여러 가지 맥락 속에서 박사님이 알고 계시는 경희대가 어떤 교육이나 그 다음에 이 미래 세대가 어떤 방향으로 나아가면 좋겠다고 생각하십니까? 정말로 공감이 가는 말씀입니다. 저 역시 강의 시간에 진리에 무조건 복종하는 지식 추구보다는 뭔가 어떤 자기 삶의 의미나 방향성을 따져보는 사유할 수 있는 방안들을 많이 얘기합니다. 아마 지금 오늘 이후로 박사님의 여러 가지 해안을 다시 또 학생들에게 전하면서 또 다른 토론의 장을 만들 수 있을 것 같습니다. 오늘 아침 정말로 이른 시간부터 기조 강연에 이렇게 아주 장시간 대화에 임해 주셔서 너무 고맙고 제가 기회가 되면 위드 코로나 뭔가 코로나 상황을 우리가 이제 그대로 안고 산다면 은 박사님을 직접 찾아뵙고 더 심층적인 대화를 나누고 싶습니다. Wonderful. Professor Sheen, I enjoyed your discussion. You asked me very important questions. We are jointly coming to insights. As Plato said, it's always it's through dialogue that we can reach deeper insights. We have had such a dialogue now for an hour. And I've learned from it as well. You ask good questions. And I hope that we can work together both through the internet and in person <coughs> as we create a global civics university in Korea and in Europe or wherever. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you very much. I want to continue to talk to you, but I want to stop here. I'll stop here. Thank you.